Hello, Fosia. Yes, salam alaikum, Sidra. How are you? Yes, alhamdulillah. What about you? you yes. Assalamu alaikum, Aisha. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam. Nice to see you on here. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. How are you, Fasila? Oh, I see you like the background. Yeah, I've got Alexa behind me today. Yeah. I've got all my favourite people on here today. <laughs> Sammy is one of my favourites and Aisha is one of my favourites. And Nisreen is on here as well. Uh, oh, the te teacher. teacher. Wow. Yeah, um, yeah the, the Dree teachers here, Nisreen Yusuf. Salam alaikum, Nisreen. Hello, salam alaikum. Salam alaikum, everybody. Wa alaikum salam. If you're ready, um, brother, you can start if you're ready. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much and uh, welcome to everybody for joining this uh, lovely educational experience once more and uh, the next one may be live in the in, uh, HICC. Uh, I'll introduce myself for those of you that don't know me. My name is Tariq Mahmood and I'm the Vice Chairman of Havering Islamic Culture Centre. Today we'll be learning about the history of Al-Aqsa and Palestine today, which is a very relevant topic to the recent situation. Uh, it is important to know about the history of Masjid Al-Aqsa and why Palestine is important to us as Muslims, so, so we can understand the politics and dilemma happening at present. Uh, I am also a student of Tajweed and I am going to recite a ver verse in the Quran which has been revealed after Allah asked the Jews to enter the Holy Land, which is Palestine. They refused and Allah was very angry with them. So this ayah is from uh, Surah Al-Maidah, uh, verse 26. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim, bismillahi rahmanir rahim, ka'ala fa'inna haumaratun alayhim, arba'ayna sanatum wa yatihuna fil ard. Fala ta'sa alal qawmil fasikeen. The meaning of that is, Allah said, this land will now be forbidden for them for 40 years and they will remain a wandering nation about on the earth. Do not grieve over the condition of these transgressing people. That's Quran chapter 5 verse 46. The details of this incident are found in the Torah and the Bible and we will be looking at it in more detail during the lecture. Uh, I learned recently there was a, t a Bible printed in 2013 with a map of uh, the Middle East and it referred to the area as Palestine. Uh, today's speaker is, uh, I'll introduce very briefly, is Ustada Sidra Naim, who is a qualified Alima teacher and university lecturer. She has a great his interest in history and has researched and presented many topics within the field of history in Islam. So that's the end of the introduction. And thank you very much for joining once again. And I'll pass you over to our expert speaker, Sister Sidranaim. Jazakallah khair. And um, I think that this is also a very, very important topic. And I think it's so important to understand the history because of the problems that we've got at the moment. If we don't understand the history, we will not understand the politics. We won't feel a passion to support Palestine as well. And um, I have actually been myself to Palestine. I went uh, approximately three years ago. So I have seen the situation myself. And while I was there, I researched the history while I was there and I researched the history before I went as well. So today I will be able to share with you live photos, real life photos as well of the place, which I'm sure you will find very, very interesting. So let me now share with you my PowerPoint. Allah help us, Allah help us, because we need to know this. Michelle. Yep, we definitely do. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So we are going to be talking about Palestine. Did you know that one of the ways we can help Palestine is to spread awareness about it? And this is my aim for today's lecture, which is why I'm doing it, to spread awareness. So we will be looking at, at the history of Palestine, 
past to present, Al-Aqsa through the ages, notice all my alliteration. And we are including the Crusades and Salahuddin as well, which uh, form a very big part of history for Muslims. The first part of my lecture, half of it will be covering all the prophets. And that is very, very important because all the prophets were involved with Palestine, most of them were and with Al-Aqsa. And then the second half, after a little tiny break of question and answers, we will cover after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So the first part will be everything up to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi And the second part will be everything after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan. Right, so this is a list of some of the prophets that actually lived in um, Palestine and had a link with Al-Aqsa as well, so some of them. So many prophets lived and they visited Palestine in their life. Some spent a short time of their life in Palestine. Some were even kings there and some were rulers of the land and some actually built Al-Aqsa as well, okay? Who can tell me from my audience who was the first prophet who built Al-Aqsa? Anybody? Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Walaikum Asalaam. Hazrat Dawood Alayhi Salaam and Suleiman Alayhi Salaam. That is a good answer, but it's the wrong answer. So a lot of people yeah. think that is the case. I think it's Adam Alayhi Salaam. Say that again, Fazia. Adam Alayhi Salaam. Oh, yes, well done. A lot of people don't know this. It was Adam Alayhi Salaam. Good, well done. So Adam al-Islam, first of all, he built the Kaaba. We already know that. That was one of the first things that he did. And then 40 years later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him to build Masjid al-Aqsa. And it, he was the one who built it for the first time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually showed him the spot as well. So he built Masjid al-Aqsa. It was the second Masjid built on earth. Okay, and it's also known as Beit al Maqdis, the sacred house. It at the moment now, but at that time when it was made, nobody knew what country that would become. But at the moment, it is in the city of Jerusalem, which is the capital, and Palestine is in the region of Sham. Okay, and um, according to the Jewish tradition, did you know that? God or Allah gathered the dust to create Adam from that area to begin with. So our roots are all where Al-Aqsa is. Isn't that amazing? Okay. Um, so Al-Aqsa is very important to us because Allah ordered for it to be built by the very first man on earth who was our great, 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 great grandfather. Um, it has since then been destroyed many, many times and repaired and rebuilt many, many times over the centuries. Okay, so moving on to our next prophet on my list is Ibrahim al-Islam. Okay, now many, many prophets, like I said to you, they lived in Palestine, visited Palestine in their life. Um, what happened with Prophet Ibrahim al-Islam, we will quickly go through the story, is that in his time, People were worshipping the sun, the moon, and the stars. They were pagans. And he didn't like it. So he opposed the people. He broke the idols, didn't he, in the temple. And then it was Nimrud who chucked him into the fire. And everybody hated him. The king hated him as well. And that is the dua which I just read today. Haspira biwa name of Akir that he said in the fire. And it was after he said that dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the fire cool. And then Allah told him to go to Palestine and live there where he will be safe from all the evil people. And this bit actually is parallel to the story of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was about to be killed in Makkah and Allah told him, go to Medina and you will be safe there. The same thing happened with Ibrahim al 
So that is when he moved to Palestine after being rejected by the people. And Allah actually asked him to migrate to the blessed land of Palestine to Jerusalem. And Ibrahim Alaihissalam, without asking any questions, he actually then went to live there to build his new home. It was there then that he married um, Sarah, his first wife. We already know about Hajj's story in my Hajj lecture, but we're going to focus on Sarah. So Sarah lived in Palestine and his second son, Ishaq, was also born there. He was 99 years old and he was blessed with a second son from his first wife. His first son we know is Ismail who came from Hajar. Um, and the child was named Ishaq. And Ishaq grew up totally in Palestine as well. And he spent his whole life in the blessed city of Jerusalem. Ibrahim Islam spent most of his life in Palestine, although he did go to Mecca here and there, to Bakka, to uh, see Hajar and also to build the Kaaba. Okay, so after building the Kaaba in Palestine, he then rebuilt Al-Aqsa, which had totally collapsed since Adam Islam's days and the flood that had come, Hazrat Nuh Islam's flood. So Masjid al-Aqsa, which was originally built by Adam, had fallen into despair after many, many generations. When Ishaq was old enough, Ibrahim and Ishaq both rebuilt the Masjid al-Aqsa together. And again, this story is parallel to what he did with his other son, Ismail al-Islam, when he built the Kaaba in Makkah. Exactly the same story. Ibrahim al-Islam then passed away in Palestine and in a town called Hebron there is his maqam and this is an actual real life picture of where I visited where they have built a shrine for him but it is not the real shrine because nobody knows where his body is he it's too old Ibrahim al-Islam was way, way years ago, uh, you know, and Musa al-Islam has been over 3,000 years since he came. So this is his maqam, and this picture is from March 2017 when I went there, okay? And in the same area in Hebron is also his wife, Sarah, Radalhu Anha, she is there as well, and Ishaq al-Islam is also buried there as well in Palestine but again these are not his, their real graves this is their um, maqam if you like like a little symbol to show that they did actually live there in Palestine so Ibrahim al-Islam is the father of all our nations he's the father of all the three monotheistic faiths so this is why I'm showing this this is very very important Okay, and uh, then we go on to the next prophet, which I am going to cover. So we already done Adam al Islam, Ibrahim al Islam, and we've done Ishaq al Islam, and now we go on to Yaqub al Islam. Can anybody tell me what the greatest significance is of Yaqub with today's lecture? Who knows this answer? His name was changed to Israel. It was well done. His name was Israel. Well done. His name was Israel. Okay. He was actually named Israel. So one of the tribes, one of his sons, they actually became Israel. Okay. So let's have a look at that chart. So who are Bani Israel, the children of Israel? Yaqub was called Israel. And he had so many sons, as you already know. Okay, so Hazrat al Qub, also known as Israel, had 12 sons. All his descendants are called Bani Israel. And Bani Israel took their name from Judah, thus calling themselves Jews or Yehudi, as you say it in Arabic. Judaism is also derived from Judah. Okay, so Israel was the top name of all of those. Um, sons if you like he was the father 
and all his descendants became Bani Israel. And Bani Israel came from Judah. Okay, and that's where we get the word Judah in Arabic is Yehuda, and from there you get the word Yehudi, which is Jew. Okay, right, and the other significance, who knows the other significance of Yaqub with our lecture today? Jesus. No, no, we are nowhere near Jesus yet, by the way. Jesus is right, comes right at the end for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyway, I would let you know, Yaqub then again started rebuilding Al-Aqsa because by the time Yaqub came again, uh, Al-Aqsa had completely been uh, broken down. Okay, and it was then that palace then that um, later on Solomon and his dad Dawood started finishing off, but Yaqub started it again. Okay, this is what I mean by it was uh, built, then it was broken down, then it was redone again and again. Okay, so Yusuf al Islam was, as we know, one of Yaqub, who is Jacob's sons. So Yusuf is the next one. Yusuf, we already know some of his story. He descended from a long line of prophets, beginning with the prophet Ibrahim al Islam was one of his descendants. Ibrahim al-Islam was his great-grandfather and Yusuf's great-grandfather uh, was Prophet Ishaq and his father was Prophet Yaqub. And Yusuf, we already know, had 11 brothers. They all, by the way, lived in Jerusalem in Palestine. That is how their story starts off and it is in there that he was thrown in the well and then taken to Egypt the story starts in uh, Palestine, and guess what? The story returns back in Palestine. So Yusuf al-Islam, he returned back to Palestine once his brothers came to Egypt and bowed down to him, and then they brought him back with them back to Palestine. So Yusuf al-Islam spent the first part of his life in Palestine, and the last part of his life in Palestine, and he also died there as well. Okay, now we go on to Yunus Lesson. Okay, we already know him as Jonah and the whale, and he actually has a significance there as well. Does anybody know what his significance is with Palestine? Can you repeat the question, please? The question is, what significance does Jonah, Yunus, and Islam have with Palestine? Is, that, is, is it where he was uh, thrown out by the well on the shores? Yes, well done, good, brilliant. I'm so happy you're here, well done. Yes, that is correct. So this is the city, Jaffa, okay? The city was the port where Prophet Yunus left on a boat around 825 BC before being swallowed by a whale according to the Bible is also where Jaffa was mentioned four times in there the village Jaffa the whale released him back at a hill near Jaffa called today Yunus Hill okay and because of its relative proximity to Al Masjid Al Aqsa Jaffa was used as the main port for Muslims to visit Jerusalem and continue to do Hajj after. And it's also your first stop if you ever go to Palestine by sea. That area, now that is a very, very old picture from before World War II, when Palestine was really, really nicely decorated. And that is a lovely big fountain in the middle of that village called Jaffa. And in Arabic, we call it Yaffa. Okay. So Yunus al-Islam's grave is also in Palestine. Now this is the house in which he lived, which I visited when I went there. And this is again a monument only. It, it, it is not his real grave, but it is a monument to mark that Yabi Yun, Nabi Yunus al-Islam did actually live in Palestine. Okay, right. The next major prophet which everybody's waiting to hear about is 
Musa al-Islam, okay? Musa al-Islam has a very big significance with Palestine, even though he never went in it, okay? Very, very interesting. However, he was one of the Bani Israel by genealogy. So he was born in Egypt and he was a direct descendant of Ibrahim al-Islam. Musa al-Islam was born into the tribes of Bani Israel, also known as the children of Israel. The Bani Israel are said to have been favored by Allah, but Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, treated them badly. And Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he didn't even know that he was one of the Bani Israel. He was, we know, the cruel king, and he was being really, really bad to the Bani Israel. The Bani Israel suffered really badly under Pharaoh's rule. And Musa al-Islam, because he was actually one of the Bani Israel himself, he genetically felt compassion for them. He felt really sorry for them when he actually saw them being um, abused, emotionally abused and physically abused. He felt really sorry. Okay, so um, the next surah, it's very, very important. Okay, now, what happened was when Musa al-Islam was leading all his people past Egypt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, take your people into Palestine, they will be safe there. Okay, at the time, Palestine was full of very big, strong people. And what happened was, the Bani Israel, who rebelled against Musa al-Islam, they said, no, we're not going in there. We're not going in there. Okay? And they rebelled against him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even gave them an idea. He said, there is a gate. And if you go through that gate, they will be able to enter very safely and take over the whole land. Okay? When Musa al-Islam said that, what happened then was the people rebelled again and they said, you go in there with your Lord, they said. They were rude to him. So they had a chance. That was their biggest chance to take over Palestine. According to Allah's law, they would have got in. But they rebelled and didn't go in. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that there would be only two people who will be, ent be able to pa uh, enter Palestine, who were the, one of the two believers who followed Musa al-Islam and said, yeah, we'll do it. One of them was Yusha, which is Joshua in English. And the other one was Caleb, Caleb in English. Those were the two 
followers who actually said, we will do it. And in the end, you will see that they do actually end up entering uh, Palestine. Okay, so let us now have a look at what those ayahs that you just heard the Saudi Imam recite say. And remember when Moses said to his people, Oh, my people, remember the favor of Allah to you. When he made prophets among you, made you kings, and gave you what he had not given to any other among the alimin, mankind in jinn, in the past. So the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing is he's reminding the favors that Allah has given to the Bani Israel. He's made all the prophets were all from that region, all of them. Okay, and he gave them so much. He saved them from Egypt. He saved them from that massive, massive calamity and the big strong fear who nobody would even believe that he would crumble. He's reminding the Bani Israel so that they will actually listen to him. Okay, so the next part then is then he asked them for a favor. Oh, my people, enter the Holy Land, Palestine which Allah has assigned to you, nobody else, Allah has assigned it to you, and turn not back in flight, for then you will be returned as losers, then Allah warns them. So first Allah reminds them of the favours, then he says, enter the land, Allah has assigned to you, which means Allah is going to protect you if you go in. And then he says, don't go back on your flight, you will be returned as losers, losers, losers. Okay? They said, oh Moses, in it are people of great strength and we shall never enter it till they leave it. When they leave, then we will enter. Two men of those, and those two men are Joshua and Caleb, of those who feared Allah and in whom Allah had his grace, said, assault them through the gate, for when you are in, victory will be yours and put your trust in Allah if you are believers indeed. Okay, so there were two strong men near the gate. Allah said, if you enter through that gate, you will be able to go in. They said, oh Moses, we shall never enter it as long as they are there. And so go you and your Lord and fight you too. We are sitting right here. Very, very stubborn, arrogant people. They actually, and that must have really hurt Moses when they said, you and your Lord go and fight. That's really bad, isn't it? Okay. So this actually signifies Palestine, which had been the homeland of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. After their exodus from Egypt, God then ordered the Israelites to go forth to Egypt, past Egypt, and then conquer that land, Palestine which was actually the homeland of Ibrahim, Ishaq and Yaqub. But when Moses directed them to march into a town and overthrow the Canaanites, which were the people, bad people that were living there, they refused, mostly out of fear and thus disobeyed the command of God. This land was promised actually for Abraham's descendants. And Ibn Khatir narrates that Moses was able to find only two men willing to fight, too frightened to enter. Yet Allah had shown how Pharaoh's kingdom destructed, which was mightier kingdom than this with more army. Still, they didn't believe. Okay. And uh, people actually who fought with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu on the Battle of Badr, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu actually quoted this incident to them. Allah had also directed Moses to lead them to the promised land, Palestine, which had been promised to Abraham as a land in which the pious and Allah fearing of his offspring would live and uphold Allah's law. The children of Israel were an ungrateful people. In spite of all of Allah's favors, they could not stay away from evil and continued to reject Allah's laws. When Moses ordered them to conquer the town of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the enemies who had hounded them, the children of Israel were cowards and they made excuses. Oh Moses, a great people dwell therein, we shall not go in unless they leave. 
And ancient books tell that there were 600,000 men. Moses did not find among them, but own two men only who were ready to fight. Isn't that so, so sad? And that was Joshua and Caleb. These two said to the people, once we enter through the door, Allah will make us victorious. Come on, they said. However, all the children of Israel were an incarnation of um, showing cowardness and quivered from within. Even though Musa al-Islam had showed them the way Pharaoh's kingdom had crumbled. Now, I focused more on this because this is crucial to understand when people are fighting for Palestine. This is crucial for us to understand what we believe happened to the Jews. And as mentioned earlier, the same story is in the Torah and in the Bible. And in the Torah and in the Bible, Allah has said, I will make you Jews a wandering nation. Okay. Moses said, O oh Lord, I have power only over myself and my brother. So separate us from the people who are rebellious and disobedient to God. Allah said, therefore, it, the land is forbidden to them for 40 years in distraction. They will wander through the land. So be not sorrowful over the people who are rebellious and disobedient to God. We heard this surah earlier on. Ayah earlier on. Moses knew that his people were fit for nothing. Pharaoh was dead, but his effect upon their souls still remained. Their recovery needed a long period of time. Moses returned to his Lord, telling him that he was responsible only for the actions of himself and his brother. He prayed to his Lord to judge between his people and himself. Allah, the exalted, issued his judgment against this generation whose nature was corrupted by the Egyptians. They must wander restlessly in the wilderness until the whole of that generation of worshipping the golden calf completely dies or they become completely senile and then they have created a brand new generation. A generation which had not been defeated from within and which could fight and score victory. And then the days of wandering began. Each day was like the one before it. The people traveled with no destination in mind and total state of bewilderness. All those who went wandering, they all died. And like we said before, this detail of this incident is actually in the Bible, in Deuteronomy, Numbers and Joshua. Poor Musa al-Islam had such a hard time, didn't he? He really did. Harun died shortly before Musa al-Islam, even though he was younger. His people were still wandering in the wilderness when he died. And Musa then requested Allah, please, please let me die near the Holy Land. Please let me die so that I am a distance of a stone's throw from it. That was quoted by Abu Huraira. He also added, the messenger said, if I were there, I would show you his grave below the red sand hill on the side of the road. Okay. One of Prophet Musa's uh, life ambition was actually to lead his people into Jerusalem. However, his people were not ready for that victory. So Musa Lassam, still made dua to Allah that he wanted to die near the Holy Land near a stone's throw. So when he died, he was just outside Jerusalem. And this is Musa al-Islam's mosque and maqam, which is where I went. And his, they made his maqam absolutely huge. We know he must have been a huge person anyway, because we know that all the people who were nearest to Adam and Islam were very big. And then with the Earth's atmosphere, they become smaller and smaller. And there was a, a masjid there as well, which we saw as well uh, there in that mosque. Okay. Um, Paul Musa al-Islam passed away. And it was actually his followers then who gradually then settled in Palestine. Does anybody know which prophet 
led the next generation into Palestine? I think Yusuf. Uh, not Yusuf. Yusuf's gone. Do you mean Yusha or, or Joshua? You probably meant Joshua. He was one of the ones who actually followed uh, Prophet Musa Islam and said, yes, you should enter. He was one of the two with Caleb. Okay. Now he, a lot of people don't even know he was the first prophet really who led the people into uh, Palestine, into Palestine, into Jerusalem. Let's have a look at his story. It's very complicated, but I've made it nice and easy through a little cartoon. Let's watch this. Prophet Yusha's English name was Joshua, peace be upon him. His father's name was Nun, grandfather was Ephraim, and his great-grandfather was Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him. He was a servant and a student of Prophet Musa, peace be upon him. He joined with Prophet Musa to meet Kedir, peace be upon him. When Musa, peace be upon him, chose twelve leaders from Bani Israel, or children of Israel, to send to Palestine to get information about that place, Prophet Yusha was one of them. After 40 days, all of the 12 leaders returned from Palestine and told them that the Palestinians were very big and strong. So all of the Bani Israel were very scared to attack Palestine. They denied Prophet Musa Pizipanim's order. They were even thinking to go back to Egypt. In that situation, Prophet Yusha and his friend Caleb encouraged the Bani Israel to have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, they would be the winner if they became brave to fight with those strong Palestinians and they would enter through the town gate. Some of the Bani Israel threatened Prophet Yusha peace upon him. We will kill you by storm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want that holy land to be controlled by evil people. So he guided his prophets to take over the holy land and he would help them win that city. But the children of Israel became cowards. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala became very angry at them. But he was very happy on Prophet Yusha and Caleb peace be upon them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared that no adult from Bani Israel could go to Palestine. Only Prophet Yusha and Caleb could go to that holy land. They wandered in the desert for 40 long years. In one hadith, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, The sun never stopped for any man, but only for Yusha peace be upon him. And but Yusha Islam, even though he was one of the minor prophets, he was the first hero to capture Palestine, the first one. And I'm going to talk about three heroes today all together. So he actually marks history. And that story about the sun stopping for him is actually quite unknown. A lot of people don't know that uh, the sun stopped on that Friday because we know the Jews on Friday evening, their Sabbath starts. And they have to stop fighting and do stop doing everything. Um, but uh, the sun stopped so that it was already ordained that Yusha will enter Palestine with Caleb and he will take over 40 years later. Now Yusha is the same young boy who is in the Al Khidr story. Okay, so the Al Khidr story with, uh, to do with Musa al-Islam, it's the same Yusha who was a boy then and then he later on becomes a man and he lives to a hundred years old. Isn't that absolutely amazing? Okay, right, let us now move on to the next prophet who is Prophet Dawood al-Islam. He was the king of Jerusalem. So with the next generations, what happened was I don't know if anybody knows the story of David and Goliath and Goliath Jalut, that horrible, big, strong man who was killing everybody. Dawood was actually a young boy and he managed to kill Jalut, Goliath, 
And then everybody loved Dawood so much because he saved their kingdom that they made him king. So he was actually a king of uh, Jerusalem for 40 years. And there was a lot of problems before Dawood the last son became king. So people were fighting different areas. There were Jalut's army, Goliath's army, and then there were the nice people there. There was a lot of fighting going on. But once Dawood the last son became king, there was peace between all the different tribes who lived in Palestine. And by the time Dawood the last son was king, Masjid al-Aqsa was in ruins. So he then decided to rebuild it with his son, Solomon al-Islam. A lot of people know that it's Dawood al-Islam and Solomon al-Islam who built al-Aqsa, but I've showed you how many times has it been built so far, at least three times, hasn't it? Okay. Unfortunately, Dawood al-Islam passed away just before completion of building that masjid. Okay, and then once Dawood al-Islam passed away, Suleiman al-Islam then made that palace really, really grand. He made it so grand that there was no kingdom like it before him or after him. It's the same palace which uh, Bilgis uh, came to visit and she lifted up her dress because she thought there was water on the floor, but the water was actually under the floor, okay? He made it like Jannah. You know, they say that there will be uh, gardens under which rivers will be flowing in Jannah. He made the rivers flow underneath everybody's feet, under the glass floors. And this is what he said. His dua to Allah was, oh my Lord, Forgive me and bestow on me a kingdom not allowed to anyone after me. Okay, that's in chapter 38. And uh, Suleiman al-Islam was greatly loved by Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him many miracles like controlling the jinns. And he even understood the language of animals like his father did as well. Um, and he spent a lot of money on Al-Aqsa and it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful, the most beautiful that it has ever been. Okay, right. Now I want you to think very carefully with the next answer. Who do you think is the next prophet who will now come and live in Palestine? Think of David and the king. That will be your clue. Anybody? Ibrahim alayhi salam? No, Ibrahim's gone. <laughs> He's dead and buried. Uh, okay, think of David's city. Once in royal David's city. You can tell I'm a teacher now. Come on, there's another teacher on here. Salam, Isa al-Islam. Isa al-Islam, good, well done. Isa al-Islam is the next major prophet now from those descendants who will come in Palestine. And yes, everybody, he was Palestinian. <laughs> he was Palestinian. Okay, so Imran and his wife, we're going back to Mary, did not have any children. So they always prayed to Allah to bless them with a child. And they promised Allah that if Allah gave them a child, they would dedicate that child to Masjid al-Aqsa. Okay, so Maryam came along really because Hannah, Maryam's mom, had said she's going to dedicate that child to al-Aqsa. Okay. Zakaria al-Islam was still asking for a baby at this stage. So along comes Maryam first and then Jesus. Okay. And uh, I'm going to put a little video on which gives a little quick summary of Maryam, who was actually lived in Al-Aqsa as well, when she uh, was then sent there by her mum 
to live there because the mother wanted to fulfill her promise to Allah and she went to live in Al-Aqsa inside the masjid where she worshipped Allah day and night and it was there that Jibreel Islam, Angel Gabriel came and said that you're going to have a baby and you're going to call it Jesus. So let's have a look at the video. In the Quran, the miraculous birth of Jesus without a father is described as follows. And mention, O Muhammad, in the book, the story of Mary, when she withdrew from her family to a place toward the east. And she took, in seclusion from them, a screen. Then we sent to her our angel, and he represented himself to her as a well-proportioned man. She said, Indeed, I seek refuge in the most merciful from you. So leave me, if you should be fearing of Allah. He said, I am only the messenger of your Lord, to give you news of a pure boy. She said, How can I have a boy while no man has touched me, and I have not been unchaste? He said, Thus it will be. Your Lord says, It is easy for me, and we will make him a sign to the people and a mercy from us, and it is a matter already decreed. So she conceived him, and she withdrew with him to a remote place, and the pains of childbirth drove her to the trunk of a palm tree. She said, Oh, I wish I had died before this and was in oblivion, forgotten. But he called her from below her, Do not grieve, your Lord has provided beneath you a stream, and shake toward you the trunk of the palm tree. It will drop upon you ripe, fresh dates. So eat and drink and be contented. And if you see from among humanity anyone, say, Indeed, I have vowed to the most merciful abstention, so I will not speak today to any man. Then she brought him to her people, carrying him. They said, O oh Mary, you have certainly done a thing unprecedented. O oh sister of Aaron, your father was not a man of evil, nor was your mother unchaste. So she pointed to him. They said, how can we speak to one who is in the cradle a child? Jesus said, Indeed, I am the servant of Allah. Okay, so in there, the first scene you saw was in Masjid al-Aqsa, where Jibreel al-Islam comes and gives Maryam the news of the baby that was in Masjid al-Aqsa. She went out of Masjid al-Aqsa to have a baby in the desert. But then she comes back, returns back to Palestine. So the last scene you see there where he uh, speaks from the cradle is actually back just outside, just outside Masjid al-Aqsa in Palestine, that scene is. He, she comes back to that temple. So um, the beginning as well where you saw her worshipping, that is actually uh, Masjid al-Aqsa where uh, you know, uh, Allah told her, worship your Lord, prostrate yourself and bow down in prayer and those who bow down. Um, that area is actually here. And this is the exact room which I have visited. Alhamdulillah, blessed really to have gone there because I don't think anybody will get a chance now to go to Al-Aqsa with all the stuff that's going on. But this is that exact room where she prayed to Allah and she um, uh, was visited by Angel Gabriel. This is her room there. And it's still there in Al-Aqsa, inside the masjid. Okay? And uh, this whole conversation, which I'm going to put on now, was all in this actual room. Mm -hmm. وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاكِ وَطَهَّرَكِ وَاصْطَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ Behold the angel said on Mary, Allah has chosen you and purified you, chosen you above the women of all nations. 
إذ قالت الملائكة يا مريم إن الله يبشرك بكلمة منه اسمه المسيح عيسى بن مريم وجيها وجيها في الدنيا والآخرة ومن المقربين. And when the angel said, O oh Mary, Allah gives you glad tidings of a word from him. His name shall be Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary. He shall be highly honored in this world and in the next and brought near to Allah. قالت رب أنا يكون لي ولد ولم يمسسني بشر قال كذلك الله يخلق ما يشاء إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيكون She said my Lord how will I have a son when no man has ever touched me the angel answered, Thus shall it be, Allah creates whatever he wills. When he decrees something, he merely says, Be, and it is. So all that happened in that room I showed you. And you know what is really interesting? It was at that particular moment that Zachariah, who was also in Al-Aqsa Masjid, he was the Imam of Al-Aqsa Masjid, he was also praying to Allah. This is his mihrab where he was praying and it is still there even today we saw it and uh, his conversation is actually also happened right at this very point right in al-aqsa masjid so let's hear that <laughs> قال رب هب لي من لدنك ذرية طيبة إنك سميع الدعاء. My Lord, grant me from yourself a good offspring. Indeed, you are the hearer of supplication. فنادته الملائكة وهو قائم يصلي في المحراب. أن الله يبشرك بيحيى مصدقا بكلمة من الله وسيدا وحصورا مصدقا بكلمة من الله وسيدا وحصورا ونبيا من الصالحين. Then the angels called him while he was standing in prayer in the chamber right here in this place you, you're seeing now. Indeed, Allah gives you good tidings of Yahya, John, comparing a word from Allah who will be honorable and a prophet from among the righteous. My Lord, how shall I have a son when old age has overtaken me and my wife is barren? He said, Thus Allah does what He wills. Oh my Lord, appoint a sign for me. The angel said, the sign for you shall be that you shall not speak to men for three days except by gesture. So Zachary al-Islam was the Imam of Al-Aqsa Mosque. He asked for a son there and a sign wondering how he would know that this miracle was really happening to him and to his wife. And Allah replied that Zachariah would lose the power of speech and not be able to communicate except with signals. So Zachariah actually emerged from the masjid, uh, uh, from his praying place, unable to speak. And I have included Quranic ayahs in this lecture of which they are right in the masjid, where, where it's linked directly with Masjid al-Aqsa to show the importance of Masjid al-Aqsa, if you like. Okay, so I've been quite uh, clever there in creating that experience for you so you know how important Masjid Al-Aqsa is. Okay, so Yahya 
and Zakir al Islam, they were both in Palestine. Again, there you go, another two prophets there. And it was in Masjid al Aqsa that Isa al Islam grew up. This is his cradle. This is his little cradle. And it's right inside Masjid al Aqsa. Um, and it's actually in that same room that I showed you earlier where Jibreel al Islam visited Maryam. Okay, isn't that just so amazing? This is his real cradle. It's still there today. Very, very emotional place. When I went there, I felt so emotional because there was just so much history there to have a look at. One of the best holidays I've been on, actually, is to Palestine. Okay. Jesus was the last prophet of the Israelis who prophesied them the coming of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah had had enough of Bani Israel. He had had enough. It's written in the Quran. They rebelled against Musa al-Islam. They killed Zakari al-Islam. They tried to kill uh, Jesus, but obviously Jesus was lifted up. And Allah said, the next generation now will be my people, for my people will be the Arab nation. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu will be the next lineage. They are going to now take uh, all the prophethood because all the previous prophets Allah had given to the Israeli region okay and Israel is not a country we know that's Yaqub's name okay so uh, when Jesus came he actually told everybody that after me now another prophet is going to come and his name will be Amen وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَاةِ وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِي وَمُبَشِّرَ بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٌ فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ قَالُوا هَذَا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ Okay, so that is actually uh, obviously happened in Palestine and it was from Palestine that Jesus was lifted up as well. I do actually have a photo of that as well, but that's in my uh, Easter lecture, if you ever want to see those photos of the exact place where he got lifted up from at the Last Supper. And uh, a lot of people didn't believe him. They said, well, Ahmed, where is he? But Ahmed, we know, is an anagram of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa Ahmed, Muhammad, Mahmud, uh, Hamid, all of them. They're all the same root words, which mean Muhammad. Okay, now that region where all of that story happened is the original Al-Aqsa Masjid, which is, this is what it looks like. Okay, and all this was built afterwards around that area after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away. That area was built afterwards to preserve the area of Zakaria al-Islam's mihrab, Isa al-Islam's birth cradle place, and the lovely room where Maryam Radalhu Anha actually uh, prayed. Okay, it was all built afterwards. It's a big area. All of that area is Al-Aqsa. Okay, and this is also the region in which everybody prayed towards the Qibla is in there as well. Okay. That is the Qibla place that everybody, including the Jews, all prayed towards before the next prophet comes. Which prophet are we on to now, everybody? Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Good, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now he was born in Arabia, but he has got a very big significance with Palestine because we know that the mirage actually happened from the mirage started the the mirage uh, part which was taking from the Kaaba to Al-Aqsa Masjid the first part was there the mirage and then it was from actually Al-Aqsa that Isra took place 
yeah, the night journey, he was actually lifted up from there. And it is actually, now you've seen all the other prophet stories, you know why he was taken there, okay? Because that was a land for where all the nations actually started from. Even the dust from Adam was taken from there, okay? So Al-Aqsa is very important to Muslims and it has been blessed by Allah. And the first part of the journey, which was, um, sorry, the night journey, was Isra first, which was from the Kaaba to Al-Aqsa Masjid, and then from Al-Aqsa up, he went, was the Mirage, right from Al-Aqsa Masjid, okay? And those are the two parts, and it's from there that he ascended. And that is Laylatul Mirage, which is the night where the ascension took place. And the other very, very important thing that happened there was, which I will come to in a minute, but let's hear the next ayah, which is in the Quran to do with Al-Aqsa. إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير. Okay. Glory be to him who made his servant travel by night from Masjid al Haram to Masjid al Aqsa, whose surroundings we have blessed to show him some of our signs. He alone is the all hearing, the all seeing. And that is actually in Al-Isra, in the Quran. And we have been told that all that area is blessed. Okay. And that area is still there today. And this is Burak the horse. And on the left, you can actually see a little hook. That is the original hook to which Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu actually tied up Burak the horse. It's still there today. And right near the hook, there is a masjid now that has been built. It's a little masjid. It's called Masjid al-Burak. And in that masjid, people go and they pray two rakats salah, nothing as well. That is inside the masjid uh, from the top balcony where the ladies were. Yes, I was everywhere taking photos. So uh, that is a, a really, really good history there for you. And like I explained to you, um, it's Al-Aqsa Masjid, the original one, which is where the Qibla was. And after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tied up his winged horse, pulled up the horse, he then prayed with all the prophets facing towards Al-Aqsa. Okay, so the original Qibla is in Masjid there, Aqsa. The floor underneath the present mosque is regarded to be the real Al-Aqsa Mosque. This area underground is believed to be the original Qibla to where Muslims initially prayed. It is in this opposite direction of the present Qibla in Mecca. Okay, and that is a picture of the area still there intact today. Um, and it is actually later before Prophet uh, Muhammad Sallallahu migrated to Medina, Allah ordered Muslims to pray towards Aqsa, and that was the first Qibla for Muslims. There, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu met all the prophets after tying up his horse, and he prayed two rakats in Al-Aqsa Mosque, um, with, and he led all the prophets right from Adam and Islam, up to him. He led all the previous Israeli prophets, if that's what you want to call them, okay? Palestinian prophets. He is the seal of the prophets. His is the last religion. He is the one who led all the previous nations there, okay? So that will give you an idea on who should be living in Palestine now, okay? Um, he was very, very blessed that day he had a very special blessing that was given to him. It was no ordinary prayer. It was not an ordinary prayer because all the prophets were there behind him. 
He led all the prophets right from Adam down to him. This place is the actual place. This is the actual place underground. It's now they've, they've built a cave, like a cave like structure over it to, uh, you know, stop it, uh, the rain spoiling it. But uh, I, I was there actually, uh, prayed in there with all my family, and it was so emotional. We all cried while we were praying because to to pray in the exact spot where the prophets are is just uh, absolutely amazing, isn't it? It really is. Okay. Now I'm going to show you a picture of what uh, what um, that area is, a real life picture now of it. There is any man talking. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, great Imam with all the prophets also here. Please, can we listen? Listen, my lady. Khalifa Umar radiallahu anhu prayed with the Sahaba here, including Prophet Bilal ibn Rabah. And this cave. And one time it was used as a storage room to store the wheat. And <laughs> the top part of the cave was a threshing floor by Ornan the Jebusites. And they were sect of Canaanites. They were Arabs. And somewhere from the top part of this rock, where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ascended to the Samawat al Ula. And this rock, known to lots of Muslims as the hanging rock, as a matter of fact, it is not hanging, you see? But according to our traditions, that it's hanging in our hearts as a very holy place. There you go, everybody. I took you live to al Aqsa Mosque just now. That is the exact area where all the prophets prayed. And you might have spotted my husband in there. He was there and we were on a tour. And that was our tour guide showing us around. Okay. This is the exact region where um, the mirage took place from. Okay. No tiles are built on that area so that everybody can see the raw ground from which uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu then went up and, uh, you know, took the mirage up. And here is a ceiling view as well from the top. Okay, very, very interesting. I will now turn back to the audience and ask them, what important event related to Salah does Surah Bakra inform us about has anybody got any answers this ayah was revealed once prophet muhammad sallallahu after the mirage went back to Mak, uh, to medina and started the last ayah of the surah bakara yeah but what important event is related to this ayah is it about is it about the amount of rakats we have of salah we no. have to read during the day no 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 Anybody else? I said changing the Qibla, is it? Good, well done, Samia. Excellent. Yes, the change of Qibla from Masjid al-Aqsa towards the Masjid al-Hari. Okay. That is what um, is actually uh, shown in that ayah. Okay. Now, um, before we finish this part, Masjid al-Aqsa, at this point then became the third holiest site in Islam. The Al-Aqsa sanctuary in Jerusalem has many virtues and blessings. It is mentioned many times in the Quran and there are many hadiths related to Masjid Al-Aqsa. Numerous messengers and companions of the Prophet are buried still in Palestine. And a hadith by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us that a prayer in uh, my masjid, which is uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling us Medina Masjid is worth 1,000 times, and a prayer in Al-Aqsa Masjid is worth how many times? More reward than anywhere else. Does anybody know? 500 times. Good, well done, 500 times. 
Now, all of that information that I gave to you, which was to do with all the prophets, uh, is taken from Ibn Khatir's um, explanation. Okay, now that's I'm halfway through and I am running on time. And now I'd like to ask questions before we go on to the time after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, uh, can I just say Masjid al-Haram is 100,000 times, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. good. Any questions? So far, please. So we've got to understand, do we understand everything so far? I've got a question, please. Yeah. Uh, when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu led the other Prophets in prayer at Masjid al-Aqsa, yes. did the other Prophets come in physical form or spiritual form? That's something... Probably know. spiritual form. Spiritual. Yeah, probably spiritual form. The other thing is that when he went up to the mirage, up to Allah, on the way up, he actually saw Musa al-Islam's grave, which was just outside Palestine, and he saw him praying in there as well. Okay, so that's really interesting. So, so that bit about Musa al-Islam saying that he would like to pray... Uh, he would like to die uh, near the the homeland, yeah, the holy homeland, just within the, a, a throne, a, a distance of a, of a of a stone. Is actually then true? He showed that because he saw it. Okay, Priscilla. Yeah, you know, you're showing the picture of the dome of the rock. I was yep. told that's not the real Alexa. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you all about that later because all the building and stuff happens later. Okay. Okay. The real Alaksa is what I showed you already when I showed you the black dome. And it's not black because it's silvery when I went. It was tin sort of color, tin, silvery gray. But it shows black in photos. That's the original Alaksa, like I already mentioned. But the rest is going to come later. We're going down the timeline slowly. Okay. We're only up to the bit where Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went up and I showed you the region. The building part I'm going to talk about later. That happens much later. Okay? Okay. Okay, one more question and then we will go back to... Yes, please. I, I'd like a question. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, what's the name of the Prophet Caleb in Arabic, please? Silab. Silab. Yes, who's, and he's who's, not a prophet. He was just a one of the uh, disciples of Musa Lesna. And Joshua uh, is Yusha. Yusha bin Nun. Is called Yusha bin Nun. That's right. That's right. And did you know Yusha was one of the descendants of Yusuf Lesna? Okay. He was one of his descendants. Okay. Good. Very nice. Good questions. Anybody else before we go on to the next half? Um, Salaam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Sorry, I'm quite new to this platform, so I apologize if it's a silly question. But I think you mentioned about um, Sarah radiallahu anha and Ismail alayhi salam's um, sort of monument or, you know, their graves is in Palestine. Yeah. But obviously they lived out of Palestine, so was it? No, no. Ibrahim al-Islam lived in Palestine with his yeah. first wife, Sarah. Okay. She couldn't have children. So he married Hajar, the slave girl. And with her, because Sarah got jealous, he then went to Makkah, which was Bakkah in those days. And that's when he had Ismail al-Islam, his firstborn. Okay. But then he would leave his wife and come back to his first wife quite a lot he would uh, come and go yes most yeah. of his life he lived in uh, Palestine and uh, that is then where he built Al-Aqsa with his son and he died there as well hey, thank you Jazakallah okay. okay. sorry for getting but, confused um, no it's not a silly question at all um, if you want to see the whole of that story in detail if you watch my Hajj lecture the history of Hajj it's all in there on my YouTube channel Jazakallah. I will give you details of my YouTube channel later on, Thank on you. the chat. Okay, right. Shall we press on, everybody? Are we ready? Are we excited for the next bit? Because <laughs> I'm excited. Yes, inshallah. <laughs> I am excited now. So let us now move on to 
after Prophet Muhammad وسلم, what happens next in Palestine. Okay. Now, it was actually in Umar Radalhu on whose reign that Islam started to spread. Okay. Now, remember that Islam is only in Mecca and Medina at the moment. Okay. And Abu Bakr was only Khalifa for a few years, wasn't he? And after that, then Umar reigned. He was the second Khalifa of Islam, and it was during his caliphate that everyone lived in justice and security, which you will find out in a minute. And it was during his caliphate that the Muslim state extended and Islam spread into many, many parts. Umar was also a very bold, and when I mean bold, I don't mean he didn't have hair, I mean bold as in courageous. He was a giant man. And he had been one of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu's chief advisors. So he had a lot of wisdom, a lot of wisdom. Okay. And he was big and strong and Islam began to spread in his reign. Okay. And he was actually Khalifa for 10 years. And Alhamdulillah, he did a lot in those 10 years. He is the second hero who enters Palestine. Okay. So the first one was Yusha. And Umar is the second one. By the year 637, the conquering Muslim armies reached Jerusalem. And uh, the patriarch, Sophronius, he refused to surrender the city unless Caliph Umar himself came to accept the surrender. So Islam started to spread and there was a Christian, Sophronius, king living in uh, Jerusalem. And he didn't want to surrender. He said, I'm not going to surrender unless the, unless the Caliph Umar himself comes to accept the surrender. So Umar ibn al-Khattab left Medina, traveling alone with one donkey and one servant. And when he arrived in Jerusalem, Sophronius was amazed that the Caliph of the Muslims, who was actually uh, someone of you know, good nobility, was dressed in simple robes. So already he painted a very good picture of Islam to this Christian king because he showed him that no matter how strong your position is in society, you still need to be humble. Okay? And then when he went there, Umar was given a tour of the city, including the church of the Holy Sepulchre. Does anybody know what happened in the church Sepulchre? Two very important things happened there. Does anybody know? Is it um, the one that Abraha built? No, no, it's, no, it's no. not. That was in Yemen, that was in Yemen. This is very it's holy to the Christians and it's linked with Jesus, that's your clue. Is it the church of Nazareth? No. What do you think is in that church? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ascended him from uh, to heaven. No, it isn't. It isn't. All allegedly, he's buried there. He's yes. Good. Well done, Fasilla. His but burial is there. He, you know, Christians believe that he died on the cross and then he was buried. Mm -hmm. Yes. So they believe his, his grave is there and mm -hmm. then his um, resurrection happened from there as well. And you there's a stone it. that people, when people visit there, I went there, there was a stone that they, he was anointed on that stone. Right, and brilliant. People, now, I wasn't allowed to go in that area, so I'm really happy somebody's there who actually went there. Yes, yes you a, are right. You it's are a right. small, tiny on the ground place. And they show you this great big slab of stone that people go and they rub oil on it and they believe that um, he was anointed, I suppose, after he died on that slab of stone. It's quite worn and polished. Right, uh, excellent. I asked if he's actually there. They said, well, it's, it's alleged. Yes, good, well done, brilliant, excellent. What a brilliant audience I've got today. So yes, that is the place where apparently 
uh, after the cross when he died that's what christians believe we don't believe this okay he was put in in this uh, grave and uh, from the grave he rose again okay and then this church was built afterwards by the christians to preserve that area okay because remember all this happened out in the open so Sophronius invited Uma to pray inside the church and Umar, now this is just so interesting, Umar who refused to pray in the church in case Muslims would later convert it into a mosque and deny Christians of one of their holiest sites. Instead, Umar who prayed outside the church where a mosque later was built called Masjid Umar. Okay, now that actually shows you, interestingly, just how much wisdom he had. Because his wisdom said, don't pray there, otherwise, later on the Muslims are going to come and they're going to make that church into a mosque. He wanted to keep it a church. Do you think he won the heart of uh, that Christian king, judging by this incident? definitely yeah yeah the king goes oh wow i like this man he's going to protect us we're weak now because the muslims were becoming really strong and he said you know what i don't mind this man ruining me because what he's going to do is uh, he's going to look after us we can't win the battle anyway there is going to be a battle so that is what exactly what happened the Muslims wrote a treaty allowing each religious group their full freedom to worship, which was previously banned by the Romans, and it was called the Umari Treaty in 637. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, this is the assurance of safety which the servant of God, Umar, the commander of the faithful, has given to the people of Jerusalem. He has given them an assurance of safety for themselves for their property, their um, churches, their crosses, the sick and healthy of the city, and for all the rituals which belong to their religion. Their churches will not be inhabited by Muslims and will not be destroyed. Neither they, nor the land on which they stand, nor their cross, nor their property will be damaged. They will not be forcibly converted. No Jew will live with them in Jerusalem. The people of Jerusalem must pay the taxes like the people of other cities and must expel the Byzantines and the robbers. Those of the people of Jerusalem who want to live with the Byzantines, take their property and abandon their churches and crosses, will be safe until they reach their place of refuge. The villagers may remain in the city if they wish, but must pay taxes like the citizens. Those who wish may go with the Byzantines and those who wish may return to their families. Nothing is to be taken from them before their harvest is reaped. If they pay their taxes according to their obligations, then the conditions laid out in this letter are under the covenant of Allah, are the responsibility of his prophet, of the caliphs and of the faithful. So this is just absolutely amazing, really, without any fighting or anything, he actually won the hearts of all the Christians and then they could actually enter Palestine very nicely. So the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu then conquered Jerusalem and bring the city under Muslim control. Okay. Um, so in 637, Palestine comes under Islamic rule. Hooray! And in 637, Christian patriarch Sophronius surrenders Jerusalem to Umar Radalhu Anhu ibn al Khattab, the second Khalifa of Islam, and agrees to the conditions of the Omari Treaty, which I just read out. And for the next 462 years, Jerusalem is ruled by Islam. That's a lot, 462 years, with religious freedom for other faith groups protected according to the Omari Treaty. Jews are allowed by Umar to worship again at Temple Mount and the Wailing Wall, 
which Umar had actually restored himself. Look at that interfaith that's going on there. Christians are not forced to convert to Islam and their churches were all maintained. The Omari Treaty sets a new international standard in religious tolerance according to Sharia law. So it is Muslims, did you know, who promoted interfaith first, those of you are, who are in interfaith. Although the Byzantine Code prevented Jews residing in Jerusalem, within months, Jewish families began to resettle in its precincts very happily under Islamic rule. And there's a picture of Sophonius as well. And Umar then cleared the area of the temple mount where Prophet Muhammad ascended to Jannah. The Christians had used the area as a garbage dump. Umar and his army personally cleaned it and they rebuilt Masjid al-Aqsa and they built this as well around the footprints of Prophet Muhammad And this structure is the exact focal point of the Dome of the Rock. OK, um, the, this is the exact dome of the rock, which Fasila was asking about earlier. The original Al-Aqsa Mosque is the one with the black dome. Feet stood uh, here and Prophet Muhammad feet stood here and you could smell musk. Yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. And he actually then was the one who constructed the masjid around this exact area. So all this area was all new and he made it in the colors of red and green which are the colors of Jannah. Red is the Yakut when we look at the um, red rubies and green is the beautiful lush green gardens. So I'm going to show you a snapshot. I'm going to take you in Masjid Al-Aqsa and you can have a look. It's absolutely beautiful. Here it is. فيقول ما منعك من عبادتي فيقول يا رب جعلت علي ناسا يملكونني فلقت رب اليمين للناس قال فيؤتى بيوسف عليه السلام في عبوديته فيقول ان تكون لا شك عبوديه ام هذا قال لا بلا قال فانا Okay, um, that was actually taken on Juma Day, where we read Juma there that day. Now, it was initially started getting built by Umar, but then later on, other Khalifas then uh, painted and grand and gra you know grandized it all as well. Um, and uh, later on, Khalifas built up the area around the place. It was very colorful. I explained the colors already. A small prayer house erected by Umar the second caliph of the Rashidun Caliphate, but was rebuilt and expanded by the Umayyad Caliphate. Abdul Malik, uh, and then finished by his son al Walid in 705 CE. The mosque was then completely destroyed by an earthquake in 746, and then rebuilt by the Abbasid Caliphate, Al-Mansur, in 754. It was rebuilt again in 780. Another earthquake destroyed most of Al-Aqsa in 1033. But two years later, the Fatimid Caliphate, Ali al-Zahir, built another mosque whose outline is preserved in the current structure. The mosaics on the Ark at the Qibla end of the um, place also go back to this time as well. Okay, so there is a lot of history that I've just told you there, which you can see there at the moment. And now this is in the future then years, the whole area got built. So as you can see on the right, the black dome is the actual uh, original Al-Aqsa Masjid where Maryam and Jesus and Zachariah al-Islam were all there and um, the Qibla was. On the left, you can see the gold dome, okay, and that was built later. Masjid al 
Qibla refers to the Grey Dome Masjid within the Al-Aqsa Sanctuary. The Gold Dome Masjid is known as the Dome of the Rock where the footprints of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi The whole of that area of the two Masjids is actually blessed. And um, in 691, the Dome of the Rock building is completed in Masjid Al-Aqsa. And uh, the walled area around the Masjid is called Al-Aqsa Sanctuary. There are actually 12 gates that lead up to the compound. And in the late 7th century, the Umayyad Caliph Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan built the dome structure around a rock, believed to be the site where the Prophet Muhammad rose up to the heavens. So the gold dome came actually later. Masjid al Kibli refers to the grey dome, Masjid, like I said. The gold dome masjid is known as the Dome of the Rock. The whole area is blessed. The whole of Al-Aqsa compound is 14 hectares. That is equivalent to the size of 13 football pitches. Okay. Um, and all the goats, all the gates are all named after different people. And we've got Al-Nazar, Al-Asbat, Maghribi, Bani Ghanim, all these kinds of things. Okay, let's now move on. And then Umar, he actually appointed Ubada bin As-Samith, who was a black companion with a pure white heart, uh, and he was a pious Muslim. He appointed him as the first teacher and judge of the Palestinian people by the Caliph Umar, because Umar had to then go on to all the different places to spread Islam. So he appointed him as the first teacher and judge. He is believed to have spent some period of time in the city of Jerusalem. And Amr ibn al-As, he helped conquer cities in Palestine, all the other cities, and then moved on to conquer Egypt and parts of North Africa. Okay, now the Crusades are going to start because don't forget the Muslims, they took the land from the Christians, didn't they? They took over from the Christians, even though they took over without any bloodshed. And the king himself was very, very impressed, the Christian king. Okay, but the Crusades then start coming. So for the next 462 years, Jerusalem was ruled by Muslims. And then in 1099, the city was captured by Christian crusaders, sadly. Okay. And this is then when Slaudin comes into the picture. 88 years later, Sultan Slaudin al Ayyubi reconquers Jerusalem. Now, this is how. Okay. And this part is quite important for you all to uh, listen uh, to how that actually happened. So let us have a look. Born as Yusuf ibn Ayyub in 1137 in Tikrit, Iraq, he was a Sunni Muslim Kurd and I have mentioned that for a reason that he is Sunni because there is going to be a lot of Shia Sunni conflict at the time he comes. Although born Yusuf ibn Ayyub, once Slaudin was a great warrior, he earned the name Al Malik Al Nasir Slaudin, which means mighty defender, righteous of faith. The last part of his name, Slaudin, was shortened by Westerners then to Slaudin. That's how he became Slaudin. His father was an officer in the army of the Seljuk leader Zangi. When Yusuf was seven years old, his family moved to Lebanon, where his father was in charge of a castle. That's how his interest got into the army and battles. Yusuf studied Islam, so he was intelligent as well. Maths, philosophy and law. Because guess what? Intelligence was needed to do the work that he had to do. He learned how to be a soldier, use a bow and arrow, fight with a sword and ride a horse into battle. 
Now, some of this is reminding me of Umar, Umar radiallahu anhu, the way he was. He was big and strong, he knew how to fight, but he had common sense and wisdom as well. This is how, uh, what Yusuf had as well, he was Slaudin. When 14 years old, Slaudin began his military career by working for his uncle, Shirku. Shirku was a high-ranking officer in the army of leader Nur al-Din. Slaudin learned about battle and politics. In 1169, Shirku and Slaudin took their army to Egypt to help fight off crusaders, to help the Fatimids. They were victorious. When Shirku died, Slaudin took control of the army and became the Sultan there. So he was then became the Sultan of Egypt. The Fatimids, by the way, were Shia, which is why I have in particular mentioned that Slaudin was a Sunni Muslim Kurd, because I'm going to talk about all of that in a minute. And Slaudin's leader, Nur al Din, then died in 1174. He then took his army to Damascus and claimed Nur al Din's position. He was already under him, already, anyway. Okay, so um, Slaudin then became the Sultan of Egypt and Syria as well. So he started becoming really strong, like the original Muslim armies. Because he was Sunni, he then managed to unite both the Shia and the Sunni dynasties. Okay, so the Abbasid Caliphate, which he took over in Syria, and the Fatimid Caliphate, which was Shia in Egypt, he combined them both and made the Ayyubid dynasty. This is how Islam then became strong. So he abolished the Fatimid Caliphate and realigned the country's allegiance with the Sunni Baghdad based Abbasid Caliphate and founder, became founder of the Ayyubid dynasties. Okay? Originally, did you know those two dynasties were big rivals of one another? That one's Shia, that one's Sunni. So he actually managed to do that. And then the first thing he did was he united all the Muslims to make everybody really, really strong. And you know, all these numbers, all of these numbers are all the regions where he actually made reunited all the Muslims. He spent the next 12 years battling other Islamic factions, factions in order to unify the region. By 1186, Slaudin was in control of the Muslim empire. He then turned his sights on the crusaders from Europe. And that is the best way to do it. If you have got unity, you can do everything. If you have not got no unity in Islam, which we're going to come to later on, like what's happening now, you can't do anything. You're weak. So Slaudin Alayubi united the Muslim lands before launching an attack on the Crusaders who controlled Jerusalem. He could not have achieved this goal without unifying the Muslims first. So he had good people skills as well. Okay, let us now have a look at what happens next, how he recaptures Jerusalem. We never say he captured Jerusalem, by the way. He recaptured it because it was already Muslims when the Crusaders took it over. And that was done in 1187. Here we go. Why is Saladin so significant from a historical standpoint? Saladin lived between 1137 and 1193. He was both the Sultan of Syria and Egypt. And the reason why he is widely known is because he got to defeat multiple Crusader states at the Battle of Hattin. He also captured Jerusalem in 1187. He got to unify the eastern part of Egypt down to Arabia. He got to maintain his supremacy. In doing so, Saladin repelled the Third Crusade, and he also managed to destroy the Latin East states. 
He is indeed an iconic person from that time, both thanks to his political and warfare skill, but also thanks to his personality. The Muslim state coalition started to break down, and that's when Saladin stood out, claiming he was the rightful heir. It was at that time when he managed to take over Egypt, something that was hard to fathom at that time. Saladin unified the Muslim world. After he became the Sultan of Egypt, he went on to capture Damascus in 1174. At that time, he claimed to be the Sunni Orthodoxy protector. The fact that he has removed from the Shiite Caliph in Cairo actively brought a lot of weight to his claim. He was accepted as protector, and then he went on to unify the Muslim world, or at least create a coalition. Since there were so many city rulers and states, that felt very difficult in the beginning. Yet Saladin was one of those people that never gave up. In order to create the coalition, Saladin had to rely on a combination of diplomacy and warfare. The Caliph of Baghdad recognized him to be the governor of Yemen, Egypt, and Syria. But Saladin wasn't always about warfare. He usually tried to get things done the diplomatic way. He married Nur ad-Din's widow, as well as Unur's daughter later on. He managed to associate himself with two important ruling dynasties at that time. Saladin also had a reputation when it came to the way he behaved and how he worked with other people. He was focused on bringing justice into the fold, all while being very generous. On top of that, people saw him as the defender of Islam. He created an Egyptian fleet to prepare for any possible attacks that would come from Christianity. By the time 1185 arrived, Saladin was in complete control over Mosul and he signed a treaty. Him and the Byzantine Empire would work together to combat the Seljuks. They were a thorn in both empires' sides, so it's easy to see why Saladin wanted to get rid of them. Around that time, there were issues regarding who would rule Jerusalem. The Franks attacked the castle of Karak in April 1187, which was commanded by Saladin's son at that time. Due to the attack, he started gathering a huge army that had Jazeera, Aleppo, Syria, and Egypt. Of course, the Franks created their own army, and they battled at Hattin. The Battles of Jerusalem and Hattin At the beginning of July, Saladin brought around 20,000 troops to the Battle of Hattin, and he faced Franks that were commanded by Guy of Lusignan, which at that time was the King of Jerusalem. They had around 1,300 knights and 15,000 infantry, so Saladin's army had a lot more people. On top of that, Franks were short on water and supplies in general. Saladin's army set the dry grass on fire and that made the enemy's situation even worse at that time. The others had nowhere to go. Saladin brought a massive victory at Hattin thanks to that. Some of the captured nobles were released for a ransom, including Guy of Lusignan. In September 1187, Saladin went ahead and captured Jerusalem, which was pretty much undefended at that time. The Christians from the eastern side were allowed to stay in the city, even if most churches were turned into mosques. He went on to conquer Caesarea, Jaffa, Nazareth, Tiberia, and Acre, among others. The Third Crusade It was in 1187 when Pope Gregory III called for a new crusade with the idea of getting Jerusalem back. At that time, the kings of Germany, England, and France responded and they created an alliance. They joined Guy of Lusignan and then they tried to siege Saladin's land. There was a massive battle in September 1191 on the plains of Arsuf. Saladin's army didn't suffer major losses. Okay, now what's very interesting is that Salahuddin used the tactic of Prophet Muhammad and Umar in two ways. So first of all, he married Nur al-Din's widow, okay, to strengthen ties with all of that nation. And uh, 
he married a, another daughter as well of another place to strengthen the ties. This is exactly what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did. He married wives from different nations to strengthen the, the uh, Islam. Okay, so he used religion and then he actually used uh, all these tactics from uh, Umar Radahu Anhu with the, the treaties and things of protection of uh, the Byzantines and things like that. So he had all that wisdom of the religion as well, which is why, you know, if you've got knowledge of religion, then Allah makes you strong and uh, helps you to combat everything. So it, it's very, very interesting there. If you look at his style, the way he did it, he, 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 he used both of those role models, the prophet and uh, Umar as well, okay? And then we talked a little bit about the Third Crusade there, which uh, happened because uh, what happened was after Slaudin Ayyubi uh, did manage to reconquer Jerusalem, then they came back, the Christians, didn't they? But when the Christians in Europe heard of the defeat of the cr Crusaders and the loss of Jerusalem, they mounted the Third Crusade under the leadership of King Richard the Lionheart. The Crusaders soon wore down and realized they would not be able to take Jerusalem. Slaudin and King Richard agreed to a truce. In 1192, they signed the Treaty of Jaffa, which kept Jerusalem in the hands of the Muslims, but allowed for the safe passage of Christian pilgrims. So again, interfaith there. They allowed the safe passage of Christian pilgrims. The scenes of that film were from the Kingdom of Heaven, which is a film all about Slaudin, and they do portray him in a good way in that film. I have seen that film. Um, and once his mission was complete, twice he reconquered Jerusalem. What do you think happened after that to Slaudin? I want you to think of previous prophets once their mission is complete, what happens to them? Did he have enemies who, who killed him? No. Think of Hazrat Nuhal as Islam. One, he uh, uh, saved everybody and the ark landed. He died, didn't he? Within a couple of weeks, he died. Look at Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As soon as he conquered Makkah, broke all the idols, he did his last sermon and he got ill and then he died. Okay? So it was like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent Slaudin to, to reconquer Jerusalem. As soon as his mission was complete, he passed away, poor thing. Okay, so here is the next part of the video. Death and legacy. The truth is that he did end up acquiring a lot of artifacts. That being said, he didn't profit that much from the Crusader departure since he died on the 4th of March, 1193. He was only 56 years old at that time, and it's speculated that his death came from the time and effort spent on all the campaigns. Saladin is widely known for the fact that he created the Ajubid dynasty that continued to rule Syria until 1260 and Egypt until 1250. Saladin left a massive legacy in the military world, but he also shared a literary legacy too. His diplomatic skills and leadership skills in particular were the topic for many books. A lot of people still respect and appreciate his work and the unique way he managed to control so many different regions throughout his lifetime. Okay, so that now covers the whole of Slaudin's life, okay? He was the third hero to uh, enter and invade, if you like, reconquer Palestine. The first one was Yusha, the prophet. The second one was Umar, the Radlihu Anhu, and Slaudin was the third. And let us now listen to this, because this is all to do with the treaty, which was to protect the Christians and their churches. And the Islamic uh, warrior Saladin conquered the Crusaders mm -hmm. and took control of Jerusalem. All right, he entered into an agreement that 
that the, that the Muslims would protect the Christian churches. And so he appointed two Muslim families. Both of these families had been in Jerusalem for, uh, you know, close to a thousand years. And each generation has passed down the key, the key, right? The, the physical key. Mr. Um, Judah said that the key he presently has is 800 years old. It's mm, incredible. <laughs> and this is a Muslim. I mean, yes. Adbi Judah is, is a Muslim. And he said it's also it's a great honor for a Muslim to hold the key to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is the most important church in Christendom. That's not disrespectful. We, we don't I hear this in America. Generation. We don't hear because what, what we have been told is Christians, Christian Americans, and uh, you know, you, you should hate Muslims. You should kill Muslims because they, they're going to tear down all the churches yes. and and, and uh, you know, basically just ransack them and everything else. But here we have two families that for nearly a thousand years have actually been watching over. Yes. Christian churches. That's right. So who? Plant it into our minds here in America that we should hate and kill Muslims. Who planted that thought in our head? Because it, it came into our society after 9 11. That's correct. So 9 11 was a calculated, uh, uh, planned operation and it changed everything in our country. And so we were saturated with media propaganda which who owns the media in this country? So we're saturated with this media propaganda. You Americans, you need to hate Muslims. You need to go to war. You need to send your sons to go kill Muslims, all right? And yet, when you go to the Middle East, you find out that the Muslims, like Christians, uh, are taking care of Christian churches. Yes. Do not hold animosity against Christians or Americans, uh, uh, except in the case where Americans are pushing for war in their countries or right. trying to take their land. So they've lived together. They've lived together for centuries and centuries. Jews, Christians, and Muslims have lived together for centuries. They were buying and selling. They were trading. They were doing business together. They were building houses next door to each other for centuries. And it didn't change until the Zionists came. Now, see, you know, wait a minute. I thought Zionists are Jews. They are, not, not all Jews are Zionists. And not all Zionists are Jews. Right. Zionism is a political movement. Yes. Right. It's an ideology. Yes. yes. Not an ethnicity. And so when the Zionists came to Jerusalem and in Palestine, basically in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, all right, they came to agitate. They came to to infiltrate, they came to seize control. And so they, they formed uh, paramilitary groups, Ergen, uh, like Ergun. And that's where Ariel Sharon and Menachem Begin, and these guys were young terrorists. And, and so there's where the hatred started to come in. The, the fighting, the animosity, the bitterness. But it, 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 it didn't start until the Zionists appeared. Jews, Muslims and Christians were coexisting. Yes, That's right. Okay, now, it was actually Umar who, and who, who actually um, established all of this stuff in Islam. So we are supposed to follow the Quran, then everything that Prophet Muhammad did, and then next the Khalifas, especially the ones who knew Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the, the rightly guided Khalifas. And he is the one who actually established this within Sharia law to protect minority states. Okay, so in our religion, even now in Syria, there are churches. They are not, uh, they are allowed to practice their own religion, non-Muslims non are. So we are actually the founders of interfaith, really. Okay, right. Slaudin's gone and his nation was brilliant because they ruled for hundreds of years, Palestine. Who is now the next Islamic generation who grow up really strong, who are now going to invade Palestine, but they're still Muslims? Big empire that came after that. Anybody? Possibly the Ottomans. Yes, good, the Ottomans. So along come the Ottomans. In 1516, the Ottoman Empire takes control of Palestine. 
but nobody's worried. You know why? They're Muslims, okay? And they had power. They actually ruled quite a lot of countries. So then they rule uh, the, the empire. And under their rule, Palestine really flourishes, actually, because they have architecture in their religion, and they implemented that into Palestine. Uh, we've got architecture there, we've got villages there, we've got one of the most famous soap factories in the Muslim world called the Nambusi Shaheen from Nabus, which exported to 22 countries. Remember, the Ottoman Empire had lots of trades with other countries, so they brought money in as well and took goods out of Palestine into other countries. And look at the hospital there. How beautiful that hospital is, so clean. Remember, it was Muslims and the golden age of Islam that, uh, you know, all the inventions that went into all the hospitals. Here's another really good picture of all the streets, the trees, spacious streets. Um, and there was a Jewish minority living in peace under the Muslim rule even then. Fancy buildings, sparkling clean streets. Um, the world ignorantly thinks that Palestine was empty and completely undeveloped until it was invaded by Israel in 1948. These historical images from 1930 to 1940 show us that not only Palestine was beautiful, it was highly developed for its time, um, rivaling even with the most beautiful European cities of that uh, time, such as London, Paris and Berlin, you know. Here is um, another picture. They also had architecture and art, theatres and concerts as well. The top left, 1937, is actually a concert. Um, and you can see the Ottomans there with their hats on, the fezzes, playing their instruments on the top right. We've also got, uh, because Palestine had all these lovely attractions, it attracted people from all over the world. So there is Jerusalem airport with tourists coming from all around the world. And there is Palestine Airways Limited as well, an aeroplane. They came from all over. They had good currency, they had stamps, they had a Philistine newspaper, which used to go everywhere. And they had very good education system where people from all over the world would go there and study as well. So it, you know, it was absolutely fine until the Ottoman Empire started getting weakened. And that was just at the First World War where the Ottomans joined um, Germany in the war. Germany lost and the Ottomans lost as well. And that is where the Ottoman Empire became really, really weak. And uh, it gave a chance then for Europe, who hated the Ottomans because they had signed with Germany, sided with Germany, to start taking over the Ottoman lands. Okay, so it was at the First World War something really awful happened, where the Europeans tricked the Muslims. They sided with the Arabs. Now remember, Slaudin was Arab, wasn't he? Okay. And the Ottomans took over, even though they were Muslim. And the Ottomans were hated by the Arabs. This is where within Islam, there's all these divisions again. And the Muslims said, well, the Arabs said, you know what? We will join with you, Europeans, and let's invade Palestine because we want to get our back with the Ottomans who took the land from us in the first place without thinking, hang on a minute, the Ottomans are Muslim, so does it matter? Okay, remember Muslims, they do their truces and their treaties and they stick to it, but Christians may not. It tells you that in the Quran, doesn't it? Okay, so let us have a look at what happened next. This is very, very important in light of what's happening at the moment. On November the 2nd, 1917, the Foreign Secretary Arthur James Balfour writes an important letter to Britain's most illustrious Jewish citizen, Baron Lionel Walter Rothschild, 
expressing the British government's support for a Jewish homeland in Palestine. The letter became known as the Belfort Declaration. Okay, and that is the actual letter, which uh, I don't even want to read, to be honest. It makes me sick, all of this. <laughs> so, dear Lord Rothschild, I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government the following declaration of sympathy with Jewish Zionist aspirations, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and politi political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. I should be grateful if you would bring this declaration to the knowledge of the Zionist Federation. So in 1917, the Ottoman forces are defeated at the Battle of Jerusalem by the British Empire, sadly. And here is the history that took place. Palestine and Israel. It starts with the end of a world war, Muslims fighting each other, and a promise made by the West only a century ago. So here's how the story begins. It's 1916 and the First World War is raging on. The Ottoman Empire is 617 years old at this point and is on the brink of collapse. The British and the French had promised the Arabs sovereignty and Arab leadership over the Arabian Peninsula and the Levant if they helped them defeat the Ottomans. And so the Arabs said, okay. And so they helped them defeat the Ottomans. So when the British and the French won, the Arabs wanted the land that was promised to them, but little did they know, the British and the French had this little top secret meeting. And in this top secret meeting, it was planned that the captured Ottoman province will be divided into areas of British and French control and influence. The British would receive Palestine, Jordan, and Southern Iraq, while the French would control Southeastern Turkey, Northern Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. This was called the Sykes Picot Agreement. But then the Arabs found out about this agreement and they were shocked. They had been bamboozled and tricked. They thought that they were fighting a war in order to overthrow their non-Arab Muslim rulers only to end up with, you guessed it, European colonial rulers instead. Now that the British occupy Palestine, something unusual is happening back in Europe. You see, the Zionist movement had been growing increasingly influential and lobbied hard to support the mass migration of Jews to Palestine and recognize a Jewish claim to the Palestinian land. And in 1917, Britain out of nowhere publicly declared its intentions of establishing a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. So the British just gifted Palestine, a country which was made up of 90% Palestinians to European Zionists. Now, at this point, the Jewish population in Palestine was less than 10%. So when the British started to facilitate the immigration of European Jews to Palestine from 1922 and 1935, the Jewish population rose to 27%. With the British mandate in full swing, mass European Jewish immigration meant that more land would be seized and the native Palestinian population grew increasingly worried. The Palestinians would demonstrate their concerns to their British overlords, but they wouldn't have it. European Jewish settlement was on the rise. The British proposed a partition of Palestine and even advised the forceful removal of the Arab population from their homes. And yes, this was their plan to resolve the issue. So the Palestinians naturally rejected this proposal and revolted against the British. The revolts were crushed violently, killing thousands of Palestinians. But the Palestinians wouldn't give up. They would continue their fight for independence and the British were clearly fed up. So in 1947, the British decided to hand over their responsibility for Palestine to the United Nations. And so the UN proposed this ridiculous proposal again, where Palestine will be partitioned into a Jewish and Arab state. Remember, Jews in Palestine only constituted one third of the population, most of whom arrived from Europe just a few years earlier. Yet in this proposal, they were allocated 55% of the land. Feeling like they got a bad deal, again, the Arabs rejected the proposal 
and the Zionists accept it. However, here's the catch. The Zionists didn't agree to the proposed borders and even campaigned for more land. So they agreed to an Israeli state, but didn't agree to the size of it. So they can just choose it for themselves. By 1948, Zionist militia would storm and capture Palestinian populated villages and cities, leaving thousands of Palestinians homeless and landless. The Zionists wanted to seize and cleanse as much land from Palestine before the British would officially withdraw their forces. And on the same day that they left, the Zionists proclaimed the establishment of the new Israeli state. Overnight, millions of Palestinians lost their country. And what's even more bizarre is that immediately, the two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, recognized the new state of Israel. And if it couldn't get any worse, May 15th, 1948 was perhaps one of the darkest days in Palestine's history. They called it the Nakba, or the catastrophe. To lose your country, your identity and your home just like that is something truly horrifying. But that wasn't enough for those Palestinian men, women and children. They had to be ethnically cleansed from their lands and driven into near total destruction. Okay, so 1948 is when Palestine was still there, but Israel, all of a sudden Israel, the word Israel came. Okay, it did not exist before that, which is why if you read any documents, any Bibles, any books, before 1948, you would ne not hear the word Israel. Okay, that was our, the Second World War when all the Mus all the Jews got expelled out of Europe and they had nowhere to go. And this is where the world then took pity on them and told them to go to Palestine. So Palestine is given by the British to a Zionist movement who founded the state of Israel. And this is actually a great big boatload. Jewish refugees arrive in Palestine. Okay, now what is so important to understand is that these Jews were not Orthodox Jews which follow the Torah. These are reformed Jews from Europe who went there who don't believe that the Torah is the word of God. Okay, and they have distorted the religion. I know this from Orthodox Jews. I do have links with Orthodox Jews who tell me that reformed Jews have changed the religion to suit themselves. And they don't believe that the word of God is the Torah. And it's in there that it says that you will be a wandering nation. Okay, so that is very, very important to understand. So the Zionist Jews that went there were not the Orthodox, true Orthodox Jews who, who, who believe that they shouldn't have that land, which is why you get a split in the Jews as well. So this is the boat that arrived and did you know that Palestine was so kind to them? Half of them didn't even have any clothes on when they came. Remember they had been treated extremely badly by Hitler. When the Jews entered in Palestine as refugees they had no clothes and no shoes on and the fact is the Jews were kicked out of every country in Europe and Palestine was the only country to help and support helpless Jews. They've forgotten all of that now. This was the map at the time, and uh, this actually you can all take a screen screenshot of. It's very interesting because it's got all the parts of Palestine in it with the towns and what actually happened in each of those towns in biblical history. So it's really, really interesting. Jericho is there, Bethlehem, Rafa, Hebron, Ramallah, Nablus. Gaza City. Uh, this is the majority report of United Nations Special Committee on Palestine recommended that Palestine be divided into an Arab state shown in dark grey and a Jewish state shown in light grey. The area of Jerusalem would be administered by an international trusteeship. So that's how it all actually started the politics of today you can see is all arising now as we go to modern times and these are the maps as they changed so the very first map in 1917 the yellow is all Muslims 
Then the next part in 1946, you can see speckles of white, which is actually the Jews and the, and the Zionist and is Israel. And then 1947, oh gosh, that's when it all starts really. The big partition plan happens there. And as you can see, the green, which is the Islam, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, now the last map is 2000, but now it's even less than that. And I already explained to you about the Zionist state does not represent the Jews and Judaism because there are Jewish people who are actually going against Zionists invading Palestine. Okay, now what can we do at the moment with all this that is happening? Yes, we do need to raise awareness. I have done that today. And yes, this will be going on my YouTube video channel and everybody can see it because this is history. And a lot of this stuff was taken from history books like Cyclopedia Britannica. So nobody can argue this is history. Okay, as long as you're not saying anything against the Jews, which I'll come to in a minute. Yes, you can go on uh, peace protests. I did go to one recently, which I had to really think about because uh, I didn't know what to do, whether to go or not. As long as you make it clear that it's not about the religion, it's about humanity, because there's my placard, which I had actually with me, which showed, just in case I get in the media, for being anti-Semitic. It's written on there, it is not about religion, it is about humanity then you are safe. When you want to talk about Palestine and Israel, please do not talk about the Jewish religion because that then is classed under anti-Semitism, which comes under the law and you can get arrested and you can go under prevent as a right wing extremist. Okay, it's unfair, it is unfair. But we need more Muslims in Parliament and we need a Muslim law like an anti-Islamist, -Islam, Islamic law as well. Like there's an anti-Semitism law and a law that protects uh, Sikhs as a race as well. Why has that not happened yet? 9-11 happened years ago. So everybody get in that Parliament, become councillors, become MPs. We need a law. I did say this in a national radio the other day, which came out a couple of days ago on my YouTube channel. Don't say anything about against the religion, but you can talk about humanity, which is what I'm doing. Also in my YouTube channel, uh, the radio show, which you should all watch, I publicly told everybody that we need a law in parliament to protect Muslims. Okay, we need a law to protect Muslims like there's a law for anti-Semitism and a law for Sikhs, which are the minority compared to Muslims, which is the second largest religion in the world. And did you know Jew, Jews are less than Muslims? So where are Muslims? Are they asleep or what? Okay, so get your Muslims into, uh, get your children into parliament and stuff. Also, please, please behave properly. I really hate it when people act like animals. I mean, the other day, the march I went on, you know, like in Pakistan, they go, go around in the cars and they beep and scream and yell out of the windows like it's some kind of celebration. People were doing that. And I just thought, God, please behave like the prophet. Behave in a dignified manner, the way Salahuddin or Umar Radhiallahu Anhu won the hearts of non-Muslims, didn't he? he? They promoted interfaith. Be like that. Do not be abusive. The other thing we can do is to break the economy of um, Israeli products. So try and boycott all of these things. Again, the best way is to take a snapshot of this screen because there's so many. Purchase plus plant Palestinian goods like dates and other things that are made there as well. Um, so the families can support themselves there. And the profits are also used to support other worthy causes in Palestine and grow businesses and create more jobs. Strong Palestinian businesses have a bigger say in matters that affect Palestinian people as well. And give um, 
charity as well. For example, you can give charity to plant date trees or olive trees in Palestine, which will uh, not only gain you sadgajarya, but also gain money for them as well. Write to your MPs, okay? The only way forward is to write to your MPs who can take the message back into Houses of Parliament. Some of you may refrain thinking, oh no, my uh, MP is a conservative and he's pro-Israel. It doesn't matter. Get the word across anyway, and then it's up to them what they do. Okay. And the last thing we can do, which is the most powerful thing, is do dua. I mean, I mean. Do dua to Allah to save our nation and make our own Muslim ummah strong again because they're not strong. Saudi Arabia, Dubai, they're all about money again. They have not united with the rest of the Muslims. There's stronger Muslims in non-Islamic lands like England, for example. Did you know England has done the most marches in comparison to Muslim countries, which is another sad thing, isn't it? Yet uh, you've seen the history. How important is that history in Palestine throughout the nations? So all of these things are things that we need to do. I'm now going to stop sharing and we are now going to do questions and answers. I have a question, please. Yes, Priscilla. Um, all the Arab nations around that area, my big why is why can't they reunite and stand up against Israel? But Israel is supported by America. America has a big say in what goes on. It's su supplying them with arms and, and this shield that covers the area to um, withstand the, 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 the firing that comes from Palestine. Well, the Arab nation is so vast and so rich. Yes. Why are they standing back and watching the Palestinians be persecuted like this? Yeah, I mean, it's a mixture of things. It's power again. So like you said, America is very powerful. Um, also, if you look at some of those countries like Dubai, there's a huge amount of income coming in, isn't there, through uh, the tourist industry. And they would lose that if people, uh, you know, they side with Israel. Uh, the people, the manpower is with Israel. If you look at all the media, you look at the newspapers and you look at the BBC, you look at Fox and things like that. They are all owned by Jewish um, people. So um, the propaganda is out there to create a bad picture of Palestinian. A lot of people who I know don't realize that, uh, you know, what is happening in, in, in Palestine, which is why we said we need to spread awareness. Um, also, uh, you know, the moment you start talking about Israel, people think it's anti-Semitism. And I think, now hang on a minute, it's not anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is talking against the religion. Talking about uh, human rights is not anti-Semitism. So that's where Muslims need to be careful, really. They need to speak about humanity. And all your marches and things need to do, be about humanity. Like that board you just saw that I was holding. Do that kind of board. It's not about religion, it's about humanity. I mean to say the Saudis are the guardians of, of, of Mecca and the Kaaba, and the Palestinians are the guardians of Al-Aqsa. But yet they're not getting support from the other Muslim countries. I know, it's sad, isn't it? That's the sad thing about it, you know? And it's all down to power and money. It's all down to power and money. And you, then, you know they say money is the root of all evil? Yeah. Well, you can see it now, can't you? The root of all evil, which is very, very sad. But let's see what happens. If we do all these things, write your MP, boycott Israeli products, try and increase the business and trade in Palestine, create awareness, things like that, uh, get your children into parliament. Inshallah, we will have victory. We need another Slaudin, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> we need a fourth hero now. We've had three. We need the fourth one. We know there's no prophets coming. It's going to have to be somebody like Slaudin or Umar. <laughs>
Jaza Khana. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, oh yes, let's have some more questions, anybody. That was actually very interesting, I thought. I mean, that is a that is a lecture, really, don't you think? That's that gives you everything from A to Z, doesn't it, really? On what's been ha happening there. It 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 took you right back to the beginning. Yep, started off from Adam's days. Yeah. Did you know our genetics are from Alaksa region? Because <laughs> the soil was taken from that region to make Adam. Some of Alaksa's in us, that's why we feel so strongly about it. Incidentally, I meant to let you know, it was 2012 that I went to that Christian church in the Alaksa. In the, oh, uh, oh okay. Not so 19. you've been twice. So you've no, been when twice. I to, when I went to Umrah, we only went to Alaksa. We didn't get the area where the railing wall is. Yeah. That was closed yeah. off. So we couldn't yeah. get to go to the sepul. I can't pronounce that word. Sepulchre. <laughs> Sepulchre. Sepulchre. We gotcha. couldn't go there. Nobody could yes. go there. I didn't go there. I couldn't go there. Well, I wasn't it's allowed. 2012. I had to so. stay in the Palestinian side. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't even allowed to take videos inside, but I did. I was a bit naughty. Well, I was honoured no? that we were allowed to go there, and um, I'll never forget that. Yes, yes. Okay, shall we stop there if there's nobody else? I'm going to show this lecture me. to somebody who is anti-Palestinian. I will do, because it will be going on my YouTube channel, and I do have yeah. Jewish supporters. Yeah, I'm going to show <laughs> somebody who I had a... A debate with yesterday on the Israel-Palestinian issue. I'll be sending it to the local rabbi as well to yeah. say, what do you think of this? But he's on my side. I've had a conversation with him. Yeah. Yeah, because he's Orthodox Jewish. He's not a reformed, you see. He's not a Zionist. It's the Zionist ones. I've had conversations with Zionist ones, and they jump down my throat about anything. I've done that as well, and they just jump down my throat and say, okay, okay, I only asked. <laughs> Right, okay then, thank you very much for coming today. Okay then. Okay, thank you. Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. Assalamu alaikum.